We're here on the second week of the He Shall Be Called series, going over the titles of Christ and trying to introduce ourselves to the God that He Himself, call, with, the, with the titles that He Himself called Him with, to understand Him in a new way. Last week we, we, we talked about Him being the Wonderful Counselor. This week, the next title we're going to discuss is Him being a Mighty God. As we start Advent, you know Advent means something long awaited, the arrival of something very important, and we're talking about of course the coming of our Lord. How long were people waiting for the advent of Christ? We have three promises. We have to look throughout history. Three promises throughout the Bible that we're going to discuss today. That God kept on telling His people that there was someone coming. And if you've ever waited for an important thing to come, anybody who's had children, anybody who was pregnant for nine months and has... and starts to prepare and you start to see women start acting a little funny around their 8th and ninth month they start to nest and clean everything in their house and they start to they buy cribs and they buy swings and they buy the way you prepare for this really important thing to come is much different than you would prepare for the wonderful counselor mighty God prince of peace everlasting father Let's go back into history to Genesis chapter 3. David, God told the, the, the serpent, And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. From now on, you and the serpent are going to be enemies. But your offspring is going to crush his head. And so from the first days of the creation of the world we have been waiting people have been waiting for the offspring of Eve to come and to overcome the serpent this was the beginning of God's first promise to set the hearts of his people to have hope for a solution of this never ending war against evil God's second promise was to Abraham. He told him, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse the, him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now for Jews, you have to understand that three of the characters that they are most familiar with or sets of characters is Adam and Eve Abraham and his sons and the third was David so these promises they had memorized and kept in their hearts waiting for this promise of God that somebody was gonna come and that through Abraham's seed all nations were gonna be blessed he told David when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. People have been waiting for this leader who have been promised to them for ages. You have to understand to the Jews, they were hoping that somebody was going to come and take away their gloom, their sadness, that somebody was going to be a light shining for those that were in the darkness. And then, one day, the deliverer comes and angels are proclaiming the, the fact that the Savior of the world is here and he comes as a helpless child. You could only imagine people waiting for this strong, mighty, powerful ruler to come and he comes in the form of this little baby. And so they're looking at this baby and they're thinking, what is this little thing going to do for us. What were they waiting for this baby to do for them? They were waiting for someone to save them from their sins. They had transgressed the law. There was no hope of getting into heaven because their sins, once you sin against the law, that's it. 
And so what they would do is they would offer animals and sacrifices on account of the people's sins. Well, nobody really believed that these dumb animals were going to cleanse their sins. Even St. Paul tells it in Hebrews. He tells us in Hebrews, he says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshippers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. So they were doing this short-term solution of just offering sacrifices, thinking that maybe God would wipe away their sins by the shedding of blood of, of these animals. But nobody believed it. Nobody thought that this was going to get them anywhere. So they waited. They waited that somebody would come and remove this sting of death, the sting of sin, from all generations past. From Adam and Eve, everyone had sinned and fall, fallen short of the glory of God. No one had any hope of eternity. So they needed somebody to come and to save them from their sins. They needed this person to be mighty. This person had to be strong to carry the sins of every man and woman since the creation of the world. It couldn't just be any strong soldier. Zephaniah tells us, sorry, before that, St. Paul tells us about these sacrifices and how these, this sacrifice was going to wipe the sins of all forever. He says, And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeated, leave the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Here we have our mighty God coming to sanctify us forever. It's easy to hear these words sitting in our seats, thinking, you're, you're living in the New Testament, it's not that tough for you. But you have to understand that for you, if it wasn't for the shedding and the sacrifice of Christ's blood, none of us would have any hope of entering to the kingdom of God. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And Zephaniah tells us, The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save. He is going to come and he is going to save. He is mighty. He is powerful. He can do what you think no one has the power to do. Lift up your heads. You that are burdened by your sins. He is mighty to save. Our God is mighty to lift you up. He can save the worst of sinners. And we have examples throughout the whole New Testament of the people that were considered the worst at the time, tax collectors, adulterous women. He would bring them up and said, they do not condemn you and I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Your sins are wiped away. It took a mighty God to be able to wipe away the sins of each and every one of us. David the prophet said, Who is this King of glory? Who is this one to come? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. God is mighty in battle against His and our enemies. St. Paul makes it clear to us in the epistle of Ephesians who our enemies are. Now, brace yourselves. Try to place yourselves as if St. Paul is telling you this. This is a letter. It's a message. Wake up. This is for you. Sitting in these seats, pretend that there was no people of the Ephesians, of Ephesus. Forget that. This letter is for you. And as I read it, I want you to react as if, as if you believe this is true. 
St. Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's not good news. That's not good for any single one of us. You know, you're not going to have to pick a fight with some big guy that you can weasel out of. He's talking about principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Wake up. This message is for us. Our enemy is a powerful enemy. He's a strong enemy and he desires that he would destroy you. St. Paul says he is like a lion roaring about seeking whom he may devour. The devil wants to devour each and every one of you. But he's dangerous. You can't see him. He's a spiritual enemy. You can't work out and practice your, you know, your, your jab. You cannot fight this devil, this devil with your flesh. You have to fight with your spirit. This is a mighty enemy. This enemy is like a lion going about seeking whom he may devour. And he tells us, be careful that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What are the wiles of the devil? St. John Chrysostom describes it as one who is skilled in the art of war. So I told you, by the way, somebody outside of this gym is out to get you. Somebody really wants to hurt you bad. And be careful. They're skilled in the art of war. You're like, what am I going to do? How am I going to face some commando guy that wants to come and fight me and destroy me? And he's skilled in the art of war. What, what can I do against such an enemy? Who is going to save me? St. Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. My brothers and sisters, we have a powerful and mighty God. Even Christ himself describes this enemy as the prince of this world. This is no little guy. This is the prince of the world. He's the prince of the world. This is a mighty enemy. And as you are sipping your coffees and sitting in this heated gym, I want you to wake up to understand the power of this enemy that is trying to attack us. The original Greek of be strong in the Lord means to be empowered through your union with Him. So how do we become strong through His might? Number one, through the partaking of the holy mysteries. Through the holy mysteries when you take of His body and blood, you are united with Him. You are entering into a union. Do not leave Holy Communion and go about everyday life not realizing that you have been united to the Lord. You have been united. You have been meshed. You have been mingled with Christ Himself. Be strong in the Lord. And in the power of His might, be strong through your unity with Him. We also, we also enter into union through continually entering into His presence. Now we talk about prayer all the time. But sometimes I think the way that we're praying isn't going to work. God, I need some powerful prayers because there is an enemy out there that I cannot see who is skilled in the art of war. He is the the, the the ruler of the darkness of this age. I don't want to mess with this guy. The way I pray and the way I become united is through true intimacy with our Lord. Becoming united to Him through real prayer. How many of us close the doors of our room, walk to the door, maybe light a candle, and don't set the ending time of when my prayer is going to end? I kneel and I say, Lord, I am here to be united with you and I'm going to be here for as long as it takes. 
we need union through him again his enemy is trying to destroy you and unless you take this seriously if you think this is just a normal passage that we just read in church and you know we meditate and we share quiet times about it that's not it this is a wake-up call St. Paul is saying dress yourselves with the whole armor of God because you can't survive any other way also he tells us put on the helmet of salvation we need the renewing of our minds we need to set spiritual minds on for those who are carnally minded leads to death the carnally minded the people that think and live by their flesh it only leads to death for those who live in the flesh cannot please God he's saying you need to put on this helmet of salvation I want you to have the mind fixed on salvation this is the armor of God this is the armor of our mighty God. It is this helmet that you set your mind on your eternity. Set your mind on things above. Set your mind on holy things. Guard your thoughts. You cannot be carnally minded because carnally minded people will end up in death. It's a trick from the devil. It's a trick from the devil. Each and every one of us will say, well, what does carnally minded mean? thinking in a fleshly manner thinking about me my ego my desires my wants the more your mind is fixed on you and not fixed on eternity and his kingdom and on him your mind is becoming carnal and fleshly then he tells us He tells us that the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked men, the wicked one. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, if any of you guys like to watch these like Roman war or Greek war movies, you know, and you see kind of how they take this arrow, they wrap a cloth around it, they light it on fire, and they shoot it, and this air that's going 30 miles an hour for some ha somehow doesn't put out miraculously this is not the real thing these fiery darts were used in the Roman times and it was made from this like hollow reed or like this bamboo stick one end was stopped with filled with flammable liquid and it had this wick and it had a mixture of some type of alcohol and then a loosely fitting stopper holding a wick that was slipped into the other end of the tube and then they lit it it was shot like an arrow and then as it hit the soldier the liquid would spread all over the soldier because these soldiers had iron armor and so as soon as one of these fiery darts that you see in the movies would hit one of these soldiers it would just bounce right off of the armor but this way is so clever it's filled with the alcohol so when they shoot it it would hit the armor the alcohol would spread all over this iron light on fire and you would just burn to death and so he's saying you must have this shield of faith you must guard yourself with this faith with powerful prayers centered on a powerful God I think almost today when we heard the gospel about Zacharias and Elizabeth I think maybe Zacharias had forgotten how awesome and how powerful our God might have been you know the Bible tells us they were blameless in all the commandments these were righteous holy people that deserved their prayers to be answered but what had happened is it should have never slipped the mind of Zacharias that one time Abraham in such a late age God gave him children but yet Zacharias doubted when Archangel Gabriel appeared in his room with angels that would fill this whole gym with wings that would fill this whole gym and he said I don't think so 
I don't know how this could happen. He forgot that he has a mighty God. He forgot that his God is able to do above, abundantly above what we ask or even imagine. Our God is mighty. Zacharias forgot. Zacharias forgot that God had also answered the prayers of Hannah when she gave him Samuel, the great priest of the Lord. He forgot that our God is mighty. My brothers and sisters, your faith has to believe in a mighty God. Faith is the entire leaning of the entire human personality on God in Christ Jesus. In absolute trust and confidence in His power, wisdom, and and goodness. I'm going to read that again. Faith is the entire leaning of the entire human personality on God in Christ Jesus. In absolute trust and confidence in His power. Do you have the entire leaning of your entire human personality in trust in Christ's power? You see, that's where we're lacking as Christians. That's where our prayers are weak and going nowhere. Because our faith is not the full confidence, the full reliance with our entire personality on the power of Christ. We have to believe. And then St. Paul tells us, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. What are strongholds? There are these defensive fortresses. They are, these are these territories of victory that we can't seem to get. You know, when the Israelites got into the promised land, they got into Jericho and there was these huge walls. And God told them, I want you to go around the city seven times, blowing your trumpets and making a great shout unto the Lord. And when they did it, the, the great walls came down. There was a territory that they wanted, that they needed to have. It was this land that God gave them. Do you have a territory that you are praying for victory over? Maybe it's the purity of your mind, the purity of your heart. Maybe it's the rekindling of your spirit that once has become, that all of a sudden has become cold. Maybe you're not feeling anymore the spirit of God working in your life. There's these defensive fortresses that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your, obe oh, your obedience is fulfilled. The weapons of our warfare are mighty in God. Do you believe that you can bring down these strongholds? Everybody needs to look into their life and find out what are these territories that they're dying to break into that they just cannot get through. Maybe. Your faith, your, your faith isn't in a strong, mighty God. Your faith, your weapons of prayer, your weapons of the sacraments, these are the things that are going to bring down your enemies. Every day people are telling me, God, God is not answering my prayers. They're starting to get down. They're saying, you know what? I'm ready to give up. I've been praying for five, six, eight years. God is not answering my prayer. That's it. I always tell them, so what's the other option? You're going to give up on God. What's the other option? You're going to go work for the enemy? What's going to happen? You think the en enemy is going to answer your prayers? He's going to drag you in, lead you into despair, and then destroy you. We have to believe our God is mighty to hear our prayers, to bring down our strongholds, to overcome our sins and our weaknesses. The Lord saves us from ourselves. Let us put on this mind of salvation. Let us have this mind. Fix our mind on the fact that our God is mighty to save us from our sins. Maybe you've been enslaved to a sin for 10 years. It is some type of addiction that you are enslaved to. And you've come to the point, you know what God, I'm weak. 
I understand I'm weak. I'm not going to overcome. Just accept me as I am. No. That is not the purpose of our God being mighty. The purpose of our God being mighty is to do wonderful and powerful things that you never thought you could do. It is not we that are, that are mighty. It is Him that is mighty. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You're saying, how do I access it? It's through your union with Him. Be strong in the Lord through your union with Him. Can you say that you're attached to Him? If I look to you, if God looks to you, does He feel like, man, Jesus is attached at this person's hip. De Jesus will not leave them for one second because they won't let Him. They're addicted to some Jesus. They cannot let go of Jesus. They are obsessed with Jesus. Jesus is all in all in their life. This is somebody that is going to be mighty. When you look at the fathers of the desert, and you see some of the wars that they would overcome, there's a story about St. Macarius, who was praying in his cell one day, and began to pray, and the devil hated the fact that St. Macarius was praying. So he decided he was going to attack St. Macarius. And St. Macarius ended up praying, going about his business, and the devil starts making the sounds of like these wild beasts outside of his cave. St. Macarius is still praying. The roarings of lions and bears and all this stuff. And the devil said, maybe he realizes that he's safe inside his cell. Let's get inside his cell. The demons get inside the cell. They start clanging pots and pans and making all this noise trying to distract him. He was strong. He was mighty. The devils were going crazy. They said, you know what? Let's light the place on fire. They light the whole cell on fire. He's praying. No distracted. He was strong. The only time he realized that there was something going on is when finally the mat under his feet caught on fire. Imagine. Imagine how strong he was. Imagine the strength that Elijah had when he was able to bring fire down from heaven upon the sacrifice to disprove to all the 850 prophets and priests that our God is mighty. Imagine such power. But the Bible tells us, Elijah is a man with a nature just like you and me. You know, every time I think about Elijah, I just imagine this like angelic, powerful, like crazy man that like nobody could get in his way. And St. James tells us, he's a man with a nature just like you and me. Everything he did is possible for you because our God is mighty. Because it is not man that is mighty, it is our God in us that is mighty. <clears throat> Let our faith, our faith come before God in powerful prayer and believe in a powerful God. A powerful God that is mighty to save you from your sins. A God that is mighty to save you from this enemy that is out to get you. I pray that truly we would put on this helmet of salvation, this mind of Christ. Imagine if you could think like Christ. Imagine if you had the thoughts that Christ thought. Imagine if you filled your time with the things that Christ would fill His time with. Imagine if you interacted with people in a way that Christ would interact with people, even enemies, even people that are annoying, people that are working against you. Imagine if you could have this mind of Christ. How powerful, how strong you could be against the things that break you down so quickly. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. I pray that we would have the mind of Christ. Our Lord taught us the ways of salvation. We say that in the liturgy. He taught us the ways of salvation. He taught us what it is and how to walk a life of victory. Do you want that life of victory? Do you want to stand up today and say, Lord, I want victory. I'm sick of being defeated. I'm sick of being knocked down every day by my weaknesses. 
Lift me up, Lord. Lift me up. Give me the strength that only comes from above. It is God who both wills and acts in us according to His good pleasure. It is Him that has the power that is going to act and will in us. He's going to put that will in us to do that. And glory be to God for every amen. We're just going to wait. Abuna Bisho is going to come and make an announcement, but if we can just stand and pray and then have a seat again. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our mighty God and our Savior, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You who are mighty to save us from our sins. We confess, Lord, that sometimes we lose faith in you. Sometimes we think that there's so many things, Lord, that you can't do. Or you just won't do it because maybe it's just too big. Our Lord, give us faith. Restore that faith in us, Lord, in a powerful and in a mighty God. A God that is able to transform. A God that is able to do mighty wonders, Lord, in our life. Lord, only you can see our hearts, the addictions of our hearts. Only you can see, Lord, the things that we've become slaves to. Only you can see, Lord, the traps of the enemy that he's fighting us in, Lord. We desire, Lord, to be strong in you through being united with you. That we would be attached to you at the hip, Lord, that when, when the enemy sees us, he sees a mightier God behind us and in front of us. He sees a, a God that he cannot defeat. He sees a God that is, that is willing to destroy any enemy for our, for our sakes, Lord. We come before you asking for this might, asking for this power, Lord to be demonstrated in each and every one of our lives. We, ho we thank you, Lord, for sending our mighty God as a Savior, Lord, to come at this time, this time of Christmas, Lord, in which you came to save the whole world, to remove the sins of the whole world from, from the past, Lord, till present, until the end of days, Lord. You are coming to wash away the sins of every single person, Lord. I pray that you would absolve us, and that you would wash away our sins, Lord, that you would have mercy on us, and that you would forgive us our sins. That you would prepare our hearts, Lord, to receive you in this upcoming season. That our hearts would not be filthy mangers, Lord, but they would be glorious thrones for you. Through the intercessions of the Holy Virgin Mary, and the prayers of St. Mark, and all the saints and martyrs who have pleased you since the beginning, make us worthy to pray, say, pray thankfully, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. If you could just have a seat for one minute.